So mortals ate the bread of angels. God gave them all that they could hold. Psalm 78, 25. Sorrows. Who would believe them winged? Who would believe they could be so beautiful? Who would believe they could fall so in love with mortals that they would attach themselves as scars attach and ride the skin? Sometimes we hear them in our dreams, rattling their skulls, clicking their bony fingers, envying our crackling hair, our spice-filled flesh. They have heard me beseeching as I whispered into my own cupped hands, enough, not me again, enough. But who can distinguish one human voice amid such choruses of desire? Why we dance, naked and cold. This is no time for small talk. This is a time for myth-making. This is a time for epic poetry. This is a time to tell the tales of life, love, and resilience that will become our compass in the days ahead. A time to remember the grace and calibrate the magic that infuses and informs this world. We live on the only planet where an eclipse is possible. Doesn't that seem like instructions to you? To awaken from this self-induced slumber, to emerge from this contracted isolation. We've got to drink down the darkness and dive to our deepest fathoms, peel off our fancy garments of presumed protection, to land at the bottom, naked, cold, and bruised with nowhere to go but up. Time we shed the venom that got us here, the twisted rage of blame and shame, and choose again the anger that rises pure and clean up through our feet, that draws us to our full height, knowing what must be done, clear about what has to stop, igniting us to stand for what we love. what the silence said. Do you still believe in borders now? Birds soar over your maps and walls and always have. You might have watched how the smoke from your own fires traveled on wind you couldn't see, wafting over the valley and up and over the hills and over the next valley and the next hill. Did you not hear the animals howl and sing? or hear the silence of the animals no longer singing? Now you know what it is to be afraid. Do you feel your senses sharpen? You think this is a dream? It is not a dream. You think this is a theoretical question. What do you love more than what you imagine is your singular life? The water grows clearer, the swans settle and float there. Are you willing to take your place in the forest again? To become loam and bark, to be a leaf falling from a great height, to be the worm who eats the leaf and the bird who eats the worm? Look at the sky. Are you willing to be the sky again? You think this lesson is too hard for you. You want the time out to end. You want to go to the movies as before, to sit and eat with your friends. It can end now, but not in the way you imagine. You know, the mind that has been talking to you for so long, the mind that it can explain everything, don't listen. You were once a citizen of the country called, I don't know, Remember the burning boat that brought you there? Climb in. Lover. Easy light storms in through the window, soft edges of the world smudged by mist, a squirrel's nest rigged high in the maple. I've got a bone to pick with whoever's in charge. 
All year I've said, you know what it, what's funny? And then nothing, nothing's funny, which makes me laugh in an oblivion is coming sort of way. A friend writes the word lover in a note, and I am strangely excited for the word lover to come back. Come back, lover, come back to the five and dime. I could squeal with the idea of blissful release. Oh, lover, what a word, what a world, this gray waiting. In me, a need to nestle deep into the safekeeping of sky. I am too used to nostalgia now, a sweet escape of age. Centuries of pleasure before us and after us, still right now, a softness like the worn fabric of a nightshirt. And what I do not say is, I trust the world to come back. Return like a word, long forgotten and maligned for all its gross tenderness, a joke told in a sunbeam, the world walking in ready to be ravaged, open for business. <coughs> Riddle. We do not recognize the body of Emmett Till. We do not know the boy's name, nor the sound of his mother wailing. We have never heard a mother wailing. We do not know the history of this nation in ourselves. We do not know the history of ourselves on this planet because we do not have to know what we believe we own. We believe we own your bodies, but have no use for your tears. We destroy the body that refuses use. We use maps that we did not draw. We see a sea, so cross it. We see a moon, so land there. We love land so long as we can take it. Shh. We can't take that sound. What is a mother wailing? We do not recognize music until we can sell it. We sell what cannot be bought. We buy silence. Let us help you. How much does it cost to hold your breath underwater? Wait, wait, what are we? What, what on earth are we, what? Any common desolation can be enough to make you look up at the yellowed leaves of the apple tree, the few that survived the rain and heat shot with late afternoon sun. They glow a deep orange gold against a blue so sheer a single bird could rip it like silk. You may have to break your heart, but it isn't nothing to know even one moment alive. The sound of an oar in an oarlock, or a ruminant animal tearing grass. The smell of grated ginger. The ruby neon of the liquor store sign. Warm socks. You remember your mother, her precision a ceremony, as she gathered the white cotton, slipped it over your toes, drew up the feet, turned the cuff. A breath can uncoil as you walk across your own muddy yard, the Big Dipper pouring night down over you, and everything you dread, all you can't bear, dissolves and, like a needle slipped into your vein, that sudden rush of the world. Sunday morning, early. 
My daughter and I paddle red kayaks across the lake. Pulling hard, we slip through the water, far from either shore. My daughter is a young woman, and suddenly, everything is a metaphor for how short a time we are granted. The red boats along the blue-black water, the russet and gold of, some, of late summer's grasses, the empty sky. We stop and listen to the stillness. I say, it's Sunday, and here we are in the church of the out of doors. Then wish I'd kept quiet. That's the trick in life, learning to leave well enough alone. Our boats drift to where the churring of grasshoppers reaches us from the rocky hills. A clap of thunder. I want to say something truer than I love you. I want my daughter to know that through her, I live a life that was closed to me. I paddle up, lean out, and touch her hand. I start to speak, then stop. That day, walking back from town, they somehow missed the logging road that makes a shortcut to their house, and now they are vaguely lost. The mother and her son on an evening near Christmas in 1960. But they know the road is close by and they'll find it soon. The mother sings some song we can't quite hear anymore as she carries a sack of groceries in one arm while the boy wades around her kicking dry leaves. Halfway down a hill, a quail whirs up from a thicket. The wing beats fan the boy's hair as he grips his mother's hand and turns to watch the bird disappear into the woods. A calm, nothing day. It happened long ago. In a few years, his mother will begin hearing voices, first at night, then all day. She will be committed to an asylum in Nashville and it will seem that nothing can bring her back to ordinary life. Then, after 20 years of doctors and drugs and nothing working, a calm will descend slowly, as if on its own, and she will become her old self again, only sharper, wittier, like one lost a long time who at last finds a wide road home. But it's all still far off as they walk to the house and to supper on that evening in 1960. The boy happy, the mother singing, as they find their way to a future they wouldn't believe, even if I told them. Shoulders. A man crosses the street in rain, stepping gently, looking two times north and south because his son is asleep on his shoulder. No car must splash him. No car drive too near to his shadow. This man carries the world's most sensitive cargo, but he's not marked. Nowhere does his jacket say, fragile, handle with care. His ears fill up with breathing, he hears the hum of a boy's dream deep inside him. We're not going to be able to live in this world if we're not willing to do what he's doing with one another. The road will only be wide. The rain will never stop falling. Waving goodbye. Why, when we say goodbye at the end of an evening, do we deny that we are saying it at all? As if we'll be seeing you, or I'll call, or stop in, someone's always at home. Meanwhile, our friends, telling us the same things, go on disappearing behind the porch light into the space, which except for a moment here or there, is always between us, no matter what we do. Think of the hundreds of unknown voyagers in the old fluttering newsreel, 
patting and stroking the growing distance between their nameless ship and the port they are leaving. As if to promise, I'll always remember, and just as urgently, always remember me. Is it loneliness too that makes the neighbor down the road lift two fingers up from his steering wheel as he passes day after day on his way to work in the hello that turns into goodbye? What can our own raised fingers do for him, locked in his masculine purposes and speeding away inside glass? How can our waving wipe away the, the reflex so deep in the woman next door to smile and wave on her way into her house with the mail? We'll never know if she's happy or sad or lost. It can't. Yet in that moment, before she and all the others and we ourselves turn back to our separate lives, down extraordinary, <clears throat> how extraordinary it is that we make this small flag with our hands to show the closeness we wish for, in spite of what pulls us apart again and again. The porch light snapping off, the car picking its way down the road through the dark. The word that is a prayer. One thing you know when you say it. All over the earth, people are saying it with you. A child blurting it out as the seizures take her. A woman reciting it on a cot in a hospital. What if you take a cab through the tenderloin? At a street light, a man in a wool cap, yarn unraveling across his face, knocks at the window. He says, please. By the time you hear what he's saying, the light changes, the cab pulls away, and you don't go back, though you know someone just prayed to you the way you pray. Please. A word so short, it could get lost in the air as it floats up to God like the feather it is, knocking and knocking and finally falling back to earth as rain, as pellets of ice soaking a, <clears throat> soaking a black branch, collecting in drains leaching into the ground and you walk in that weather every day <coughs> blessing the boats may the tide that is entering even now the lip of our understanding carry you out beyond the face of fear. May you kiss the wind, then turn from it certain that it will love your back. May you open your eyes to wa wave water. May you open your eyes to water waving forever. And may you, in your innocence, sail through this to that. Introductions. Let's not say our names or what we do for a living, if we are married and how many times, single, gay, or vegan. Let's not mention how far we got in school, who we know, what we're good at or no good at at all. Let's not hint at how much money we have or how little, where we go to church or that we don't what our sun sign is, our Enneagram number, our personality type according to Jung, whether we've ever been rolfed, arrested, psychoanalyzed, or artificially suntanned. <laughs> Let's refrain, too, from stating any ills, what meds we're on, including probiotics, how many surgeries we've survived, or our children's children's problems, and please, let's not mention who we voted for in the last election. <laughs> Let's do this instead. Let's start by telling just one small thing that costs us nothing but our attention. Something so simple that nourishes the soul of our bones. 
How it was this morning, stooping to pet the sleeping dog's muzzle before going off to work. Or yesterday, walking in the woods, spotting that fungus on the stump of a maple, so astonishingly orange it glowed like a lamp. Or just now, the sound of your own breath rising or sinking at the end of this sentence. A poem, my brain and heart divorced a decade ago over who was to blame about how big a mess I have become. Eventually, they couldn't be in the same room with each other. Now my head and heart have custody. Now my head and heart share custody of me. I stay with my brain during the week and my heart gets me on weekends they never speak to one another. Instead, they give me the same note to pass to each other every week. And their notes they send to one another always say the same thing. This is all your fault. On Sundays, my heart complains about how my head has let me down in the past. And on Wednesday, my head lists all of the times my heart has screwed things up for me in the future. They blame each other for the state of my life. There's been a lot of yelling and crying. So, lately, I've been spending a lot of time with my gut, who serves as my unofficial therapist. Most nights, I sneak out of the window in my rib cage and slide down my spine and collapse on my gut's plush leather chair that's always open for me. And I just sit, sit, sit until the sun comes up. Last evening, my gut asked me if I was having a hard time being caught between my heart and my head. I nodded. I said I didn't know if I could live with either of them anymore. My heart is always sad about something that happened yesterday. Well, my head is always worried about something that may happen tomorrow. I lamented. My gut squeezed my hand. I just can't live with my mistakes of the past or my anxiety about the future. I sighed. My gut smiled and said, in that case, you should go stay with your lungs for a while. I was confused. The look on my face gave it away. If you are exhausted about your heart's obsession with the future, with the, if you're, sorry, if you are exhausted about your heart's obsession with a fixed past and your mind's focus on the uncertain future, your lungs are the perfect place for you. There is no yesterday in your lungs. There is no tomorrow there either. There is only now. There is only inhale. There is only exhale. There is only this moment. There is only breath. And in that breath, you can rest while your heart and head work their relationship out. This morning, while my brain was busy reading tea leaves and while my heart was staring at old photographs, I packed a little bag and walked to the door of my lungs. Before I could even knock, she opened the door with a smile. And as a gust of air embraced me, she said, what took you so long? Now, dear, just breathe. Eagle poem. To pray, you open your whole self to sky, to earth, to sun, to moon, to one whole voice that is you. And know there is more you can't see, can't hear, can't know, except in moments steadily growing and in language that aren't always sound, but other circles of motion. 
like Eagle that Sunday morning over Salt River. Circles in blue sky and wind swept our hearts clean with sacred wings. We see you. We see ourselves and know that we must take the utmost care and kindness in all things. Breathe in, knowing we are made of all this, and breathe, knowing we are truly blessed because we were born and die soon within a true circle of motion. Like eagle rounding out the morning inside us, we pray that it will be done in beauty, in beauty. The Psychic. He said I must pay special attention in cars. He wasn't, he assured me, saying that I'd be in an accident, but that for two weeks some particular caution was in order, and he said all I really needed to do was throw the white light of Alma around any car I entered, and then I'd be fine, and when I asked about Alma, he said, oh, come on, you know Alma well. You two were together first in Egypt and then Stonehenge, and I nodded, though I'd never been, at least in this, in this life at least, to Stonehenge. Then I said, shouldn't I always throw the white light of Alma around a car? And when he said, well, it wouldn't hurt, I said, what about around planes, houses? What if I throw the white light of Alma around anyone who might need protection from the reckless speed of driving or the reckless swerve and skid of the world? And the psychic opened his hands and shrugged up to his shoulders. So despite your doubt or mine as to why I'd gone there to a psychic in, I kid you not, a town of psychics, in the first place right now as you read this, let me throw the white light of Alma around you and everyone you pass close to today, beloved or stranger, the grocer, the bus driver, the boy on his longboard, and the lady you stand silent beside in the elevator, and also I am throwing in around anyone they care about anywhere in the spin of the world because we can agree that these days Everywhere, particular caution is in order, and even if unverifiable, the light of my dear sister Alma couldn't hurt. Small kindnesses. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull their legs in to let you by or how strangers still say, bless you, when someone sneezes, a leftover from the bubonic plague. <laughs> Don't die, we're saying. <laughs> and, and sometimes, when you spill the lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Mostly, we don't want to harm each other. We want to be handed our cup of coffee hot and to say thank you to the person handing it, to smile at them and for them to smile back, for the waitress to call us honey as she sets down the bowl of clam chowder, and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire, only these brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling of the holy, these fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat. Go ahead, you first. I like your hat. Soaking up sun. Today there is the kind of sunshine old men love, the kind of day when my grandfather would sit on the south side of the wooden corn crib where the sunlight warms slowly all through the day like a wood stove. One after another, dry leaves fell. No painful memories came. Everything as lit by a halo of light. The corn stalks glittered 
bright as pieces of glass. From the fields and cottonwood grove came damp smell of mushrooms, of things going back to the earth. I sat with my grandfather then. Sheep came up to us as we sat there, their oily, warm, their oily wool so warm to my fingers, like a strange and magic snow. My grandfather whittled sweet-smelling apple sticks just to get the scent. His thumb had a permanent groove in it where the back of the knife blade rested. He let me listen to the wind, the wild geese, the soft dialect of sheep, while his own silence taught me every secret thing he knew. Before dark. From the porch at dusk, I watched a kingfisher wild in flight he could only have made for joy. He came down the river, splashing against the water's dimming face like a skipped rock, passing down out of sight, and still I could hear the splashes farther and farther away as it grew darker. He came back the same way, dusky as his shadow, sudden beyond the willows. The splashes went on out of hearing. It was dark then. Somewhere the night had accommodated him. At a place he was headed for, or where, led by his delight, he came. Sustain five. Give us this day our stone ground whole grain toast with organic butter, our fair trade coffee, our soy creamer, our free range eggs, our morning paper with its dismaying headlines, our kissing and teasing in the kitchen. Let it all go on just another day or week or 10 or 20 years. Barely enough time to slip through this life like a fish through a hole in the net or a string of pearls through nimble fingers. A long saxophone note draped around the silken knee neck of excuse me around the silken neck of night <coughs> my other dark sometimes in the dark i find myself in a place that i seem to have known in another time and i wonder whether it has changed through the sunrises and sunsets that i never saw whether the things that i remember are still there where i remember them would I know them, even if my hand touched them in this present darkness? Would they know me? And have they been waiting for me all this time in the dark? Telescope. This is the pipe that pierces the dam that holds back the universe, that takes off some of the pressure keeping the weight of the unknown from breaking through and washing us all down the valley. Because of this small tube through which a cold light rushes from the bottom of time, the depth of the stars stays always constant, and we are able to sleep, at least for now, beneath the straining wall of darkness. At the lake, a fish leaps like a black pen then, when the starlight strikes its sides like a silver pen. In an instant, the fish's spine alters the fierce line of rising, and it curls a little. The head, like scalloped tin, hinges back, and it's gone. This is, I think, what holiness is the natural world where every moment is full of the passion to keep on moving. Inside every mind, there's a hermit's cave full of light, full of snow, full of concentration. I've knelt there, and so have you, hanging on to what you love, to what is lovely. The lake's shining sheets don't make a ripple now, and the stars are going off to their blue sleep. 
but the words are in place and the fish leaps and leaps again from the black plush of the poem, that breathless space. Snowman. One must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and the boughs of the pine trees crusted with snow. And I've been cold a long time to behold the juniper shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun. And not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, in the sound of a few leaves which is the sound of the land full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place. For the listener who listens in the snow and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. The Roomba. One would have to have the mind of dust bunnies to peek under the immaculate sofa in the snug palace strewn with marbles, and to have lost one ball long ago, but not long enough to have forgotten, when watching the hail transform the ground outside into a trampoline, and to pick one orb of ice longingly out of the crowd, even in the crowd of an ice tray. Although the mold is not spherical, it is from the same well that is chilling the same cosmic drink. For the reader who listens to the hum and is not vacuuming herself, beholds the marble that is not there and the one that is. (laughs) 
shoveling snow with Buddha. In the usual iconography of the temple or the local walk, you would never see him doing such a thing, tossing the dry snow over a mountain of his bare round shoulder, his hair tied in a knot, a model of concentration. Sitting is more his speed, if that is the word for what he does or does not do. Even the season is wrong for him. Uh, in all his manifestations, is it not warm or slightly humid? Is this not implied by his serene expression, that smile so wide it wraps itself around the waist of the universe? But here we are, working our way down the driveway, one shovel full at a time. We toss the light powder into the clean air. We feel the cold mist on our faces. And with every heave, we disappear and become lost to each other in these sudden clouds of our own making, these fountain bursts of snow. This is so much better than a sermon in church, I say out loud. But Buddha keeps on shoveling. This is the true religion, the religion of snow and sunlight and winter geese barking in the sky, I say. But he's too busy to hear me. He has thrown himself into shoveling snow as if it were the purpose of existence. As if the sign of a perfect life were a clear driveway you could back the car down easily and drive off into the vanities of the world with a broken heater fan and a song on the radio. All morning long we work side by side, me with my commentary and he inside his generous pocket of silence. Until the hour is nearly noon and the snow is piled high all around us. Then I hear him speak. After this, he says, can we go inside and play cards? <laughs> Certainly, I reply, and I will heat some milk and bring cups of hot chocolate to the table while you shuffle the deck, and our boots stand dripping by the door. Ah, says the Buddha, lifting his eyes and leaning for a moment on his shovel before he drives the thin blade again deep into the glittering white snow. A Child's Christmas in Wales. One Christmas was so much like the other in those years around the sea town corner now, out of all sound except the distant speaking of the voices I sometimes hear a moment before sleep, that I can never remember whether it snowed for six days and six nights when I was 12, or whether it snowed for 12 nights and 12 days when I was six. All the Christmases rolled down towards the two-tongued sea like a cold and headlong moon bundling down the sky that was our street. And they stop at the rim of the ice-edged, fish-freezing waves, and I plunge my hands in the snow and bring out whatever I can find. In goes my hand into that white wool, bell-tongued ball of holidays resting at the rim of the carol-singing sea, and out comes Mrs. Prothero and the fireman. It was on the afternoon of the day of Christmas Eve, and I was in Mrs. Prothero's garden waiting for cats with her son, Jim. It was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. December, in my memory, is white as Lapland, although there were no reindeers. But there were cats, patient, cold, and callous. Our hands wrapped in socks, we waited to snowball the cats, sleek and long as jaguars and horrible whiskered, spitting and snarling. They would slide and sidle over the white back garden walls, and the lynx-eyed hunters, Jim and I, fur-capped and moccasined trappers from Hudson Bay off Mumbles Road would hurl our deadly snowballs at the green of their eyes. The wise cats never appeared. We were so still, Eskimo-footed Arctic marksmen in the muffling silence of the eternal snows, eternal ever since Wednesday, 
that we never heard Mrs. Prothero's first cry from her igloo at the bottom of the garden. Or if we heard it at all, it was to us like the far-off challenge of our enemy and prey, the neighbor's polar cat. But soon the voice grew louder, fire, cried Mrs. Prothero, and she beat the dinner gong. And we ran down the garden with the snowballs in our arms toward the house, and smoke indeed was pouring out of the dining room, and the gong was bombillating, and Mrs. Prothero was announcing ruin like the town crier in Pompeii. This was better than all the cats in Wales standing on a wall in a row. We bounded into the house laden with snowballs and stopped at the open door of the smoke-filled room. Something was burning all right. Perhaps it was Mr. Prothero, who always slept there after midday dinner with a newspaper over his face, but he was standing in the middle of the room saying, a fine Christmas, and smacking the air, sm and smacking at the smoke with a slipper. Call the fire brigade, cried Mrs. Prothero as she beat the gong. They won't be there, Mr. Prothero said. It's Christmas. There was no fire to be seen, only clouds of smoke and Mr. Prothero standing in the middle of them, waving his slipper as though he were conducting. Do something, he said. And we threw all our snowballs into the smoke. I think we missed Mr. Prothero and ran out of the house to the telephone box. Let's call the police as well, Jim said, and the ambulance, and Ernie Jenkins. He likes fires. But we only called the fire brigade, and soon the fire engine came, and three tall men in helmets brought a hose into the house, and Mr. Prothero got out just in time before they turned it on. Nobody could have had a noisier Christmas Eve. And when the firemen turned off the hose and were standing in the wet, smoky room, Jim's aunt, Miss Prothero, came downstairs and peered in at them. Jim and I waited very quietly to hear what she would say to them. She said the right thing always. She looked at the three tall firemen in their shining helmets, standing among the smoke and cinders and dissolving snowballs, and she said, would you like anything to read? <laughs> Sheep may safely graze. Sheep may safely graze and pasture in a watchful shepherd's sight. Those who rule with wisdom guiding bring to hearts a peace abiding. Bless a, bless a land with joy made bright. The Old Life. December 21st, we assembled at the church, festooned red and green, the tree flashing green-red lights behind the altar. After the children of Sunday school recited scripture, sang and scraped out solos, they were tired to dress for the finale, <coughs> to perform the pageant again, Mary and Joseph kneeling cradleside, three kings, shepherds and shepherdesses. Their garments were bathrobes with moth holes cut down from the church's ancestors. Standing short and long, they stared in all directions, looking for mothers, sisters, brothers, giggling and waving in recognition. Then at the South Dansbury Church, a moment before Santa arrived with her ho-hos and bags of popcorn, in the half-dark of whole silence, God entered the world as a newborn again. The 
the newborn. Even in sleep, her face changes as if every weather were just passing over its surface, just for a moment. Sun and storms, a chill at the nostrils, the moderating climate of a half-formed smile. They were all there, the emotions that are not even a dream in her future. You can see them in the way the, first, the fist uncurls at the end of her arm like a long-stemmed rose, or in the frantic way her mouth searches, driven now by a craving for milk, that old thirst in the genes. Donkey Elegies, 16. Mary knew, tupped by the Almighty, she was no fool now, knew that bright singe was the small dark crown of a half-god, insisting, making its way through the small door between her legs. Slumped in the swaying saddle, broken water wetting her blue robe black, her pains divine, she clutched the dusty tufts, yanked the hair from the root, took for her suffering the steady, uncomplaining mane of a donkey. 25. Blessed be, you know how it goes, inherit thee. In the stall, I stop for a pleasing sound a steady prayer deep on the mill of teeth, an echo within his long and humble skull, a plain song of persistence, of hunger met with plenty of time to chew. Listen, can you hear it too? In his dutiful mouth, the pulp and resignation, the grit and patience of everything grown by the sun, surrendered but saved, brought back by the common low-life, base-born, absolute holiness that is this donkey. The Lamb. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, soft as clothing, woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the veils rejoice. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Lo, Lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. If a child and thou a lamb, we are called by his name. Little Lamb, God bless thee. Lo, Lamb, God bless thee. Love does that. All day long, a little burrow labors, sometimes with heavy loads on her back, and sometimes with worries about things that bother only burrows. And worries, as we know, can be more exhausting than physical labor. Once in a while, a kind monk comes to her stable and brings a pair, but more than that. He looks into the burrow's eyes and touches her ears. And for a few seconds, the burrow is free and even seems to laugh, because love does that. Love frees. Rise up, shepherd. Star in the east on Christmas morn leads to the place where the Christ was born. Leave your sheep and leave your lambs. Leave your ewes and leave your rams. If you take good heed to the angel's words, you'll forget your flocks, you'll forget your herds. Rise up. Shepherd and follow, 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 follow. Mm -hmm. 